Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight and linking in. Um, I'm Joe Fassett. I'm executive director of the Illinois Audubon Society and I am absolutely honored to bring you this trio tonight. These guys just bring an absolute amount of knowledge and passion to everything that they do. So at this point, I'm going to turn you over to our moderator and master of ceremonies tonight, Brian Fox Ellis, who is the director of membership and education also with the Illinois Audubon Society. Brian, it's all yours. Uh, I share your enthusiasm and the honor of hosting three eminent scientists. I am so excited to hear this program. I can tell all of you, I did get a little sneak preview of some of the slides. Uh, you're really in for a treat. Um, I do want to start with just a little bit of etiquette. Um, please keep yourself muted. Uh, depending on how you run your Zoom, usually when somebody is talking, they are the screen if you're doing this in gallery view. So if you're you know, calling out for somebody to bring you a beverage, then we all get to hear that and see you make that call. So keep yourself muted. Um, and we will do the Q&A in the chat. So all the way through, we're going to hear from three different researchers talking about three different aspects of blood crown night herons. So at any point during the evening, if you want to type a question in the chat, I will be monitoring that and we'll do the questions pretty much, um, you know, first come, first serve, unless there's some overlap, I might meld a few questions together. Um, so even now you can open the chat and say hello and where you're from and, and the chat is how we'll keep track of all of this. Uh, we are recording. So again, if you unmute yourself, we get to hear you and you're part of the permanent record and that's not always a pretty thing. Um, I also wanna remind you, we had a really great program last month. This is the second of three programs and we did record last month. So if you wanna go back and hear Henry Adams and his kind of big picture talk about uh, uh, urban ecology and adaptation and, and the roots of some of this research. And then next month in uh, March, we get to hear um, Sarah Slayton, who is uh, doing a lot of the on the ground work and, and the sky work by using the tracking devices. And you get to hear about her research in real detail next month at the end of the month. So do mark your calendar. And at the end of the evening, we do have a little tease, May 9th, mark your calendar, and we'll tell you more about this special event that we're doing at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And with that, allow me just real briefly to introduce the partners. We couldn't do this without the work of a dozen people working behind the scenes and doing the important scientific research on the field. So from Lincoln Park Zoo, we have Liza Lair and Henry Adams from the Bird Conservation Network, uh, Bob Fisher, the elder in a lot of this research. We're so grateful for Bob's work um, with the Chicago Black Crown Night Heron Project. We have Amy Lardner, who's been a real motivator behind the scenes. The University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana is the home of Sarah Slayton, who is uh, doing the work and she'll present the program at the end of March. And, uh, and because I have a list of everybody who's here, there are a hundred esteemed scientists in the room. I'm so excited with the caliber of the listener who chose to attend. So thanks to every one of you without naming all 400 who registered. Uh, we're above 400 registered. We'll see how many actually show up and who's planning to, to go to the recording. Again, Q and A's all the way through and uh, type them into the chat. And uh, there's already a question, Will Graf to everyone, where would we access the recordings? So if you go to the Illinois Audubon Society, illinoisaudubon.org backslash Black Crown Night Heron Project, uh, you can see the recordings. So thank you for telling us where you're from. Thank you all for coming out and let's get started. Tonight, we have three esteemed scientists, as I mentioned. I'll let each one introduce the next, but real quickly, we have Michael Avera, Brad Semmel, and Dr. Mike Ward. Michael Avera is gonna kick off the evening. He is uh, the field coordinator at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, he's done a lot of work with the Illinois MODIS Network and uh, working with saw wet owls in the field, as well as ways to restore endangered water bird colonies uh, across the St. Louis Metro East region. A great place to go bird watching. I'll be there this weekend, looking forward to it. So with that said, um, I will give the screen to Michael Avera. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for the introduction, Brian. And thanks for everybody for being here. 
we're going to be talking about in general the uh, the story of Black Crown Night Herons and 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 their demise, but perhaps hopeful return. And so um, I'm going to start out by talking just a little bit about life history of Black Crown Night Herons to set up the whole talk, and then uh, Brad will follow with kind of a history of Black Crown Night Heron populations in Illinois and the Greater Midwest, and Mike with some of the research methods that we'll be looking at with recovery. So as we look at black crowned night herons and their natural history and ecology, we're talking about one of the most wide her widespread herons in the world. Um, they're distributed in every continent except for Australia and Antarctica, which is a pretty big spread. It's a medium-sized heron, about two feet tall. They've got a stocky build, relatively short neck. Uh, they're sexually monomorphic, um, and um, they so it's hard to tell a male or uh, from a female uh, just at a glance frequently. Um, they live to about 15 to 20 years, and one unique aspect is that the young will often return to breed close to where they were born, um, although there is variation, and you'll hear me say that a lot when I'm talking about their life history. Some disperse quite widely, and it's still unknown how much site fidelity adults show year after year, and that'll kind of set us up for Sarah's talk um, later on. Next slide. Um, so black crown night herons exhibit very unique diet and foraging strategies. They're very opportunistic foragers. They'll eat fish or other aquatic organisms, sometimes small mammals, amphibians, carrion, eggs, crustaceans, insects, sometimes even French fries in the, in the urban setting. Um, they're known for their ambush predation, so they'll stand very still like many other herons while foraging, um, often in vegetation. So oftentimes it can be challenging to spot. They'll often wade into shallow water and look for prey um, and sometimes they will actually exhibit more active hunting behaviors. I'll show you that in, in a moment. Um, sometimes they've been known to use tools while hunting. So they use other food items as bait, just like fishermen. And there's a lot of parallels between uh, black crown night herons and fishermen in general. On this particular slide, you'll see um, that in urban settings, black crown night herons use a little bit of improvisation. So as opposed to standing in water and stalking prey, uh, as you'll see in this video, and you can go ahead and press play, the black crown night herons right in that yellow circle. Um, I know it's kind of small, um, but what it's doing, res rather than stalking its prey, is just leaning over that deck and then doing a kind of a high dive off the edge of that deck. Yep, there it goes. And then kind of swims around like a duck and then jumps back onto its perch. Is this typical black crown night heron behavior that we're used to seeing? No, but you know, uh, we got to improvise when you're in uh, at Montrose Harbor on a nice balmy uh, summer night. Um, so I do apologize also for the poor lighting in the distance. If I'd been able to get any closer, I might have been able to tag that bird with a transmitter. So that's another uh, frustration that I'm sure Sarah will talk about later. So uh, black crowned night herons are known for their crepuscular behavior, meaning they're most active at dawn and dusk. They're typically monogamous, meaning they'll form pairs for at least the extent of the breeding season. And one of the key things that you'll notice uh, when you see um, these birds actually breeding is that they tend to breed in colonies. Next slide. When it comes to breeding, um, we'll kind of talk about the life cycle of a heron. So they'll start out obviously with eggs. The eggs tend to be greenish blue. The clutch size tends to be three to five eggs. And uh, the birds will incubate for 24 to 26 days. Now, both the males and the e uh, females will actually incubate and brood the eggs. It was cooperative. Um, and then typically, there is what they call asynchronous hatching. So the eggs don't all hatch at the exact same time. So you'll notice the next picture on the right as you go down, uh, actually go back a slide, please, um, is uh, nestling. Uh, they're what we call altricial, meaning they need a lot of parental care. So they beg for food from the parents. Um, and what tends to happen is kind of a darker side of these, these birds is that I mentioned there's, there's up to three to five eggs, which means three to five nestlings, but sometimes they'll actually uh, reduce their numbers in the nest through, uh, they call a siblicide, where, um, where they aren't exactly, the sibling rivalry goes a little bit too far. Um, when they're in this stage, the parents will regurgitate food for the chicks. Um, sometimes it's whole fish and crayfish. And then as you look down below the nestlings, there's pictures there of fledglings. It takes 29 to 34 days to leave the nest um, when the birds can uh, start to thermoregulate, but they're still kind of struggling to fly. So oftentimes if you're in a colony, you'll see them begging for food from the ground from any adult that they encounter until they get what they want and until they can forage for themselves. 
They move through the vegetation on foot. Um, the young from the colony will often flock together, often at the, on the ground. And then they'll start flying at about six weeks, eventually dispersing from the colony in different directions to prepare for their first migration. Next slide. So uh, the first year uh, bird, pictured up at the top right there, um, you can kind of tell there's some plumage differences between these two sta or three stages. The first year bird, kind of a juvenile, we oftentimes call it, is kind of brown all over with white streaks. You can also tell uh, the beak is a little bit um, more yellow, especially the lower beak. They have kind of yellowish orange eyes and, and yellow legs. The middle picture is a pre-breeding adult. So these herons don't really usually breed until three years old, although some might try when they're two years old. Although I'll throw the caveat that there's a lot of research that we still need to figure out that needs to be done regarding what happens with these non-breeding birds um, before they, they actually reach that sexual maturity. And you'll notice the bottom bird there is your typical breeding adult, the black head, black mantle. They've got that white plume off of their crown uh, as kind of a decorative uh, flare there. Um, they've got uh, red eyes, which is kind of unnerving for some people. Uh, next slide. So herons are social creatures. They tend to breed on um, colonial structures. Oftentimes this is an island. Um, Although it might be a literal island, it might also be a functional island. So if there's nothing, no habitat around and they're, they're just on that, um, that quote, island in the middle of, of um, the area of unsuitable habitat. And typically, this is so they have some isolation from mammalian predators such as raccoons. Colonies are variable in size. Sometimes uh, birds will nest as, as uh, just pairs or groups of pairs. Uh, but then there's also records of 600 plus pairs of big marsh in the 90s that Brad's gonna talk about here in a little bit. In some parts of the range, um, they'll form these large colonies that are actually shared by multiple other breeding, uh, wading birds like great egrets, snowy egrets, um, little blue herons uh, and uh, great blue herons. Although in the Great Lakes also, they'll nest with uh, herring gulls or ring bill gulls or common terns. Um, when they are in these mixed uh, colonies, oftentimes they rank relatively low in the hierarchy of the colony. And for that reason, as uh, pressure mounts in the colony and there's more and more birds, typically the black crowned night herons get pushed down kind of towards closer to the ground. And sometimes they'll actually nest on bare ground in such situations. Colony abandonment can occur due to environmental disturbance um, or habitat degradation or loss. This might include the natural decay of breeding uh, trees due to the buildup of guano or even the weight of the nest. Next slide. So where do herons live? It's variable. Um, coastal populations, you often see them living in mangroves or on barrier islands, oftentimes above alligators and crocodiles for security. Um, internal pop or interior populations in the Midwest, you tend to see more in uh, cattail marshes or near river sandbars or backwater lakes. Urban populations, we're trying to figure that out, um, just as the herons are trying to figure this out. Um, there's some really strange situations we've encountered. Uh, where we've seen them in Bradford pear trees and street alleys by dumpsters. We've seen them uh, nesting in Phragmites or buckthorn or any brushy vegetation they can get. Sometimes as in the zoo above red wolf enclosures uh, or sometimes even on retaining wall uh, lined islands in the middle of city parks. Next slide. It's an example of like a marsh habitat. Next. There's an example of, uh, this is in Saint, uh, North St. Louis. There's a uh, City Park with the Retaining Wall Island, next. And there's our lovely Bradford Pear uh, City Block with an alley and dumpster, next. So herons migrate, or do they? Uh, we would consider them variable migrates, migrants depending on where they are in their range. So different populations in the US have different migration strategies. In some areas of the United States, like down in Florida, um, they're resident all year long and they'll breed there as well. Um, however, there are uh, also instances of short distance migration. So again, kind of um, in more Southern latitudes, it's a much shorter hop as opposed to long distance migration, something you'd expect from like uh, birds that would winter in Northern South America, flying all the way up into the Midwest and perhaps points North. Next. So which way do herons migrate? Uh, herons move north, herons move south, and sometimes herons move north and then south. So uh, again, this is a little bit teaser to uh, what Sarah is going to present, 
But we do actually have uh, data on a bird that was actually uh, captured in Chicago, fitted with a transmitter um, that flew north before flying south in what we call a post-breeding dispersal movement, uh, where uh, wading birds will oftentimes move north uh, resources and then eventually they'll move further south. And then at the first two bullet points, I kind of skipped over as you might expect, herons, like many other migratory birds, will move north in the spring uh, as temperatures warm, and they'll move south in the fall to um, milder uh, wintering areas. So um, when it comes to the fate of water birds, many water birds have suffered some significant setbacks over the course of the past 50 to 70 years, sometimes a little bit longer. And a lot of that has to do with the impacts of wetland degradation uh, and wetland loss. And, um, and then beyond that, even uh, pesticide use and DDT. Um, talk a little bit more about also in just a little bit the, um, the millinery trade. Um, and while many of these water birds have suffered these setbacks, things like the Clean Water Act and banning DDT and use, uh, removing the use of uh, feather plumes and, and hats and adornments have actually bolstered a lot of uh, water bird populations. And you'll notice in the bottom left, the graph there's from spring bird count data uh, for great egrets in particular. And you'll notice since the 1980s, the population uh, of an occurrence of great egrets across the state has increased substantially, as has bald eagles, osprey, double-crested cormorants. But the fact of the matter is black crowned night herons have not seen that resounding uh, rebound. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So the beginning of bird conservation in North America is worth talking about uh, before I turn things over to Brad. The fact that I alluded to the millinery trade and uh, the fact that by 1886, more than 5 million birds were being killed yearly just to satisfy the needs of, of hats. Um, and feathered hats were the fashion for women of the time. Primarily this hit wading birds like herons and egrets. Um, and what happened as a, as a result is that women were encouraged to join societies for the protection of birds and this really bolstered uh, the early Audubon Society, which we're talking uh, in today. Um, and many uh, women, as a result, you'll see the picture on the left, began to wear featherless hats. Protests by Audubon Societies led to the passage of several laws protecting these birds, like the Lacey Act, the we uh, weeks mclean Act, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Acts. And it led to the eventual recovery of many water bird species in portions of their ranges. But why not black crowned night herons? And for that, I'm going to leave that to Brad. Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, uh, great blue herons, great egrets, uh, snow egrets, and other uh, folks here in, in northeastern Illinois are familiar with the St. Hill cranes and other water birds. Uh, their numbers seem to have increased pretty significantly since the banning of BDT and the uh, banning of market hunting and, and the removal from uh, the market hunting. Um, and other birds such as osprey and, and uh, double-crested cormorant and other uh, deciparous avian species have increased after the removal of DDT. But the black crowned night herons, uh, their populations have not rebounded and not gone up. Um, there's different ways that you can look at population um, of a species, as, as Mike alluded to. This is a, really a worldwide distribution, uh, but if we wanna focus here in North America, Throughout Canada and the United States, um, most of the regions where the, this is uh, data taken from the breeding, uh, breeding bird surveys, most of the regions in the US have seen uh, relatively significant declines. Uh, here in the Midwest region, uh, black crowned night herons, uh, since the, the census have started, have, have seen a pretty precipitous decline. Um, and of course, as Mike alluded to uh, previously, because these are crepuscular birds, or actually uh, most of them are, are hunting at night, trying to find these birds uh, during some of these surveys can be difficult, trying to find their, their rookeries. So a lot of the numbers can be uh, highly variable, but when you look at the, the overall trends, there is a, a declining abundance of black crowned night herons throughout its range in, in North America. Uh, NatureServe, if those um, on this uh, call are, aren't familiar, is a, a nonprofit organization that essentially gathers data from wildlife uh, throughout the world. Uh, they try to um, 
uh, talk to, to specialists and researchers about each of these species, uh, different county and state agencies. And they basically tried to, uh, uh, tried to um, put a conservation status on all wildlife um, throughout the world. And so the, for the Black Crown Night Heron, NatureServe has gathered data and suggested that there's only um, six states and two provinces where Black Crown Night Herons, their populations seem to be stable. In all the other states and the provinces in North America, um, the species have been declared as vulnerable or in some, um, some states imperiled uh, here in, in the state of Illinois, um, it has been listed as state endangered. Um, some of the states are actually critically imperiled. They've lost just about all of their colonies. Um, and some of the states on the East Coast, there's no more, uh, there's, there's no current records of, of breeding. So there's a wide range of, of status, but overall um, you can see that um, for most of the populations throughout the uh, United States and Canada are, are appearing to be uh, declining in numbers. Um, again, when, when I talk about um, trying to understand populations of black crown night herons because it's a difficult bird to find, the rookeries are difficult to, um, to census, um, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has a natural heritage database that we try to gather information from eBird, iNaturalist, citizen scientists, researchers, um, wherever we can gather the data. And I'll get to it's very important for the for the public to, to try to help us out too. There's 24 biologists that are responsible for trying to manage the, the distribution and abundance of 400 and some species uh, here in Illinois. So it's rel relatively difficult to, to really get a good handle on it. But some of these species have been uh, studied uh, quite extensively and Illinois Natural History Survey, the University of Illinois and some others have done some research here in Illinois. And it, it is pretty obvious that the, the black crown night heron in Illinois is uh, the populations are diminishing. Um, when I look through the natural heritage database, again, this is information that was provided by researchers, scientists, and the general, uh, general public, trying to get as much information as we can on, on who observed the individual birds or, or nesting colony, where that, uh, where that occurred, and we try to go out and try to verify observations of these endangered species. And so using all this information uh, in 1977, the black crown night heron was determined to be a uh, state listed as endangered by the Illinois Endangered Species Protection Board. And from that time on, um, we've tried to manage or we try to maintain uh, the database so that we can try to understand the distribution and abundance of the species throughout Illinois. Um, if I download the data, you can see um, the type of information we collect, the year, number of birds observed, the number of nests. And so we can really look at the distribution, the number of birds, not only in a time frame, but also the distribution uh, throughout the state of Illinois. Um, when we map this out, you can see that um, along the Illinois River, there are a number of colonies, a number of observations. Down in Southern Illinois, there's some isolated wetlands. But it's quite striking how there's a concentration of, of bird sightings and rookeries in northeast Illinois. And of course, that, that has a lot to do with the geography and geology of, of Illinois and northeast Illinois. That was where the glacial potholes, we have a lot of palustrian emergent uh, wetlands. That's where really the concentration of most of the endangered wetland birds, um, 20 of the 29 endangered species in Illinois are actually wetland uh, dependent, uh, anywhere from the uh, King Rail, Least Bittern, American Bittern, uh, Common gal uh, like Gallinule. So most of those uh, endangered species, birds that we have in Illinois are associated with uh, the wetlands. And due to the concentration of the, the population in Illinois, Northeast Illinois, uh, many of those, those species are listed. Um, another way to look at this, maybe a, a little clearer than, than hundreds of little dots, is trying to uh, coordinate some of those dots into uh, more generalized areas. And again, you can see there are some uh, rookeries along the Illinois River and some dispersion um, in Illinois, in southern Illinois. But for the most part, um, the, um, the, the current records are in 
uh, Northeast Illinois and, and Cook, Lake McHenry, Will and DuPage counties. Uh, so if you focus on the, the green, the, the red dots are historic records. So that was the distribution historically in Illinois um, since 1990, uh, 1977. And then the green dots reflect um, information that we have currently on, on where the birds have been seen nesting in Illinois. And again, it's concentration in, in Northeast Illinois. When you think about why this concentration, again, it was this extensive uh, wetlands that were, were found in, in, uh, in Cook County, Lake County, DuPage, Will Counties. And Lake County Met region is a great example of, of really uh, what has happened um, in terms of, oh, sorry, in terms of what's going on with these wetlands and the threats to them. Uh, the Calumet region was an extensive, uh, over 22,000 acres of wet prairie, um, uh, potholes, emergent vegetation, and uh, black pine night herons uh, were reported in this area um, by some of the early naturalists who, who birded here or, or collected most of, most of them collected birds here in, in Northeast Illinois for their, uh, for their collections. But as early as uh, 1874, it was noted that black crowned night herons were nesting in the, in the Lake Kelly Met area. And of course that area has undergone tremendous pressure from industrial, um, from industrialization. Lots of the steel mills, the, the, uh, the, a lot of the wetlands were channelized and used for a port. Um, much of the surrounding area was just uh, urbanization and, and actually the expansion of, of downtown Chicago. So when you look at the, the distribution uh, currently, um, most of the, the historic or the most well-known rookeries in North Il Northeast Illinois were around this Lake Calumet area. And uh, you can see around the uh, sites such as the Big Marsh uh, where they nested in Phragmites, Indian Ridge, Heron Pond and down by the O'Brien Locks and Dam. Um, and it's, it's quite remarkable that these birds have played a, a significant role in the conservation of the area. Their presence in the Calumet Basin has been well, well documented and well known. And I, I think this is sort of a culmination in this one paragraph of really everything that's going on uh, that kind of Mike described and how these birds are moving from colony to colony. Uh, it talks about the construction of the O'Brien Lock and Dam degraded the area so that the, the rookery there relocated to Big Marsh. And then they talk about the drainage of Big Marsh um, in the fall of 1981 resulted in the drying of the site and the, the rookery moved from there. And then you had high water levels. And so the birds moved uh, again in the spring and rediscovered in the cottonwood grove. So this kind of portrays what's going on, that these birds, for some, some birds go and they find a, a, a new nesting location, and those scouts seem to uh, be able to uh, draw other birds there as, as there's depredation impacts to the vegetation, dying vegetation, disruption by construction. But these birds do move around, and so there's sort of these colonies sort of morph in these localized areas where the colonies can persist for a number of years. Some kind of stochastic event happens, and then uh, they have scouts go out and find another location to nest, and a new new rooker will start. Um, and this sort of gives a an overview of what was happening in the Lake Calumet area. And again, I have to preface this by saying it's very difficult to try to come up with numbers for black crowned night herons. Um, some people are recording the number of nests. Other people are recording the number of birds they see. These birds, when they're in rookeries, they're very active. As Mike said, that um, these birds don't start breeding until about three years of old, three years of age. So you can have some one and two year birds in these colonies for some period of time. In the spring, you can get an influx of birds as the migrate migrants are heading north and might pass through and check out the rookery. So um, Henry uh, last presentation kind of gave some of the details. You can see on weekly uh, numbers of herons in the rookery, it will bounce pretty dramatically from week to week. And so these numbers are, are the best we can do in terms of looking at trends, but some of the, the numbers you really have to take it at uh, um, a little bit of caution in looking at, at how specific they might be. Um, 
but basically you can look at a, a site like Big Marsh, um, where in 1984, where these records started with 532 birds in there and pretty consistently for 15 years, the birds were nested uh, in Big Marsh until the area was flooded in 1999. But during that, those 15 years, every once in a while, there would be some birds that would uh, break off of that main colony. And they went to sites like Indian Ridge and nested in the, in the cottonwoods. Um, some of the birds broke off and went to Indian Ridge, but nested in the Phragmites. Um, but you can see that as, as you get a site like Big Marsh, which is pretty consistent, and then some kind of uh, pretty significant stochastic event happens, and then that site is abandoned or, or uh, there's no more nesting there. Same thing with the Indian Ridge. Uh, both of these sites were abandoned, but then the birds shift over to another site. Um, so we have these uh, rookeries that are splintering um, consistently and, and going to different areas. And some of these birds actually went over into uh, Indiana to the steel to the steel mill over steel mill over in Indiana. So this is interesting to to kind of conceptualize how these birds try to stay in the rookery as long as they're doing well, they're successful in raising young. But there are these stochastic events that suddenly the entire colony will be abandoned and they pick up and go to a different site. And what are those cues for locating that new site? And what are the cues for all the birds leaving those sites altogether? Again, um, it's most interesting to see the disparity in the types of habitat that these birds um, in the Lake Calumet area are using. Uh, some of the birds have these very extensive rookeries in uh, giant reed or, or phragmites. And of course, that's a, a exotic species that has shown up in, in the harbor. There is some native Phragmites, but unfortunately, this is a, a not, not a native Phragmites. It grows in very dense stands, but it makes for a very good nesting platforms for these birds, and they're nesting down low right at water level. But because the nests are low, they're very susceptible to stochastic flooding or uh, flooding events in that particular basin. So um, we had, of, of the seven primary rookeries in Lake Calumet, um, two of those um, were, were, were nests or rookeries that were found in the Phragmites. Um, the other rookeries were up in trees, uh, high up in the, in the cottonwoods. And so it's, it's very curious to see how these birds are actually looking at two very, very distinct habitats in which to nest. Uh, way up high in cottonwoods and right down at the water level in Phragmites. Um, one of the things, as I say, um, originally we you can look at the the, the track record of, of nesting in Big Marsh and Indian Ridge and Heron Pond is pretty consistent. There's some morphing and some breakaways and, and, and new colonies, but then something happened here in 2006 that um, birds started showing up over in the Lincoln Park Zoo that was in South Pond. It was just a small number at first, but um, you can see that in 2006, they made a pretty significant uh, change from just going within the Calumet Basin and, and split off and went off into the Lincoln Park Zoo. And, and again, sorry, I'm just having trouble with, with my Zoom. I can't, <laughs> I can't get my, my face out of the way to, to try to figure out where some of this, these numbers are. Here we go. So uh, again, in 2006, you can see that something is happening that in, in Heron Pond, uh, the Calumet Harbor, O'Brien Locks, none of those sites uh, seem suitable to the birds. And there seemed to be a, a big push for that, those rookeries to just disperse altogether. And then by uh, 2011 was the last year in which there was any recorded or documented nesting in the Lake Calumet Basin. So we had from 1984 to 2011, this pretty consistent nesting, and suddenly all the birds are gone and all the nesting shifted over to the Lincoln Park Zoo or to Cleveland Cliffs in Indiana. So we look at, again, um, very similar to the Lake Calumet area, the birds starting nesting, nesting in the South Pond, but then in, in 2010, the, most of the trees that they're nesting in had died. Uh, there was an effort to uh, revitalize the pond area and naturalize that pond area. And so unfortunately, those trees had to be cut by the, uh, by the zoo and removed. But the birds just moved nearby to a, um, a, 
an area of trees that were lining the, the sidewalks there in an alley. And uh, unfortunately, those are all ash trees. So the colony persisted for a number of years. All the ash trees died because of the danger of the trees coming down. Those trees had to be cut. But nearby were the children's zoo. And so these birds had started to redist uh, redistribution out to the children's zoo. And, and uh, they continued to nest in the children's zoo. Some of them, the birds went over to Lincoln's uh, statue and then over to um, uh, nearby, nearby areas where there were suitable habitat. Um, so when we, when we look back, we, we re realize that um, the very uh, consistent movement among different wetland basins here in the Lake Calumet, and then suddenly the birds decided to move 16 miles up into the Lincoln Park. And when they were in the Lincoln Park habitat, remember I said um, they nested consistently in the Phragmites or in the cottonwood trees. When they moved to Lincoln Park, it was totally different habitat. They were nesting in ash trees, they were nesting in crab apples, they were nesting in uh, alder trees, they were nesting in spruce trees. And so these birds picked up totally different nesting habitats uh, or nesting, nesting species or trees or nesting structures in which to nest, which were totally different from what they had done for the for the past 20 years. So it's quite remarkable that the birds chose this location given just how distinctly different it was from their historic nesting rookeries. So again, uh, just like Calumet, where they're moving from, from marsh to marsh, uh, the birds started in the South Pond area and moved down to the South of Lee and then down uh, the, the, the Lincoln statue and, and the, uh, the tomb area down here and uh, by the History Museum. But most of the birds are really up here uh, concentrated in the Lincoln Park Children's Zoo. And so you can see that very similar to Lake Calumet and historical rookeries that were moving among the basin, the birds seem to be moving above around the Lincoln Park Zoo uh, to a number of different sites looking for uh, structures that would support their nests. So when we talk about the uh, rookeries and uh, wading birds in particular, you can have these uh, rookeries along the Illinois River, Mississippi River that uh, were historic, uh, lasting 100 or more years. And what was happening along a riverine system is the, the spring water, the spring floods would come and wash away the guano, all the buildup of nutrients and the trees. And those trees could live, for, those cottonwoods could live for, for hundreds of years uh, without um, suffering the impacts of, of these heron rookeries. Unfortunately, um, when the birds are nested in very concentrated areas, this is Lake uh, Renwick down in Will County, nesting out on the islands, it's a perfect habitat uh, protected from uh, coyotes and raccoons and, and other predators. Uh, the accumulation of guano killed off, the, killed off all the trees and the vegetation. So an effort was made to replace those with artificial structures. Um, and very similarly in other areas, uh, another one of the largest uh, black hunt night heron uh, rookeries was up in Baker's Lake in Cook County. And again, the accumulation of guano um, killed the vegetation and effort was made um, uh, to put in artificial structures for these uh, birds to nest in. But things, uh, two different things are going on here. You've got the loss of the nesting vegetation, but you also have the displacement by the more aggressive great uh, blue herons that came in first. The great blue herons would move down when the great egrets came in. And then when the double crested cormorants came in, they would nest in the top and below them was the great egrets and below them was the great blue herons. And then there's no more room for the uh, black crown night herons. So we can see that these birds are used to stochastic events that they make them move their rookeries over uh, periods of time. Um, they're very adaptable to different types of habitat, but really what is not known is how do they select the new habitat? How do they select the new rookeries in which to nest? And um, uh, where do we go from, from here? So I'm gonna introduce Mike Ward that's gonna, we've got lots of questions. We can see the movement of these birds uh, um, going uh, from site to site. And we're trying to be proactive and understanding where these birds might move next, what might be uh, the stochastic event that makes these birds leave the Lincoln Park Zoo and how can we plan for that? So without further ado, Dr. Mike Ward from the University of Illinois, 
and uh, hopefully he'll come through because he's uh, down in Mexico right now. Yes. So uh, okay. thanks, everybody. So, yeah, very good. My internet kind of comes and goes. I'm, uh, as Brad said, so I'm a professor in University of Illinois. Currently, I'm in Oaxaca setting up uh, automated systems to track the migration of birds. And we're working with local collaborators here on the conservation of night jars and some other species. So it's great. This is, I'm going to turn off my videos. Hopefully, it'll be better. Um, first off, thanks to uh, Brad, um, Illinois Audubon, um, Amy, and Bob, uh, people at the Lincoln Park Zoo for putting this together. I think this is great. Um, I'm going to talk about big picture stuff. So like, why, right? So we've heard from Mike and Brad about what their fate is in Illinois, but why are they where they are? So in this current, um, Brad hit, hit a button, the, uh, the, this is a distribution from eBird. So you can see they're found throughout the Midwest in different areas but we don't really understand why they're there. All right, next one, Brad. So we see them down in Florida. If you go down there, hanging out with alligators and swamps, we got them in Chicago. So they're using a, a large array of habitats. However, the species is still declining in a lot of areas. Of course, it's not declining in Florida, some of these other areas where it's not migratory, but the migratory populations we see in the Great Lakes, East Coast, sometimes in the Great Plains, are showing these declines. And so it could be that they're making poor decisions, right? So if you're a black crowned night heron and, and your question is where you're going to breed, would you cho choose Calumet? Would you choose Lincoln Park? And then if you want to, you know, they're choosing where they want to choose, but then why are they choosing that? And how do we create more areas that they choose to breed in? Fred, next slide. So why be colonial? So I don't know if any of you guys have thought about this. I kind of get paid to think about crazy stuff about birds. And in this case, um, you know, why would you be colonial, right? So some birds are colonial to work with each other to find food, right? So if your, food's, your food is ephemeral or patchy, then you come together and you communicate to tell each other where that food is, right? So you might think that evolutionarily this is a bad choice, but it's not because they all work together that food's going to be gone, and so they can work together to figure out what those food those food resources are at. Uh, protection from predators, right? So if you have a big colony, you can fight off some predators. You have access to mates for both males and females. And in the case of black crowned night herons and some of the other species that are colonial, they need to learn to be a heron. Uh, so they don't breed for a few years, and a lot of times the young birds do a poor job of uh, reproducing. And so there's something we call social information. So essentially they learn how to be function in their colony and to be successful. Okay, Brad. So there's this uh, concept called conspecific attraction, which is the tendency for of individuals to breed near conspecifics. And this you know, was first kind of shown with puffins out in Maine, maybe 30 years ago or more, where they put uh, decoys of puffins on some islands that puffins were at, but they were gone to try to trick them to come back and breed. And that worked. And so trying to think about what cues, and puffins are colonial as well. So what is the cue to, to force a bird to, um, not force, but to trick a bird to go start a new colony? And that really, how is a new colony ever formed, right? So if, if all birds that are colonial are exhibiting constant contraction and going where there's other of their species, how do you ever get a new colony, right? So you could situa have a situation like we have in Illinois where all the birds pile into one colony, such as at the Children's Zoo, Lincoln Park Zoo, and you have hundreds and hundreds of birds. All right, next slide. Brad and I have a long history of doing constant attraction. Um, there's some work we've done on terns in Northeast Illinois with foresters and common terns. We've worked down the St. Louis area with least terns and it's worked well. The, in, the, in the context of terns, it's vocalizations. We play vocalizations of terns. They show up, they wonder what's going on here and then we provide the habitat and they start breeding and it works out pretty well. Next slide. Of course, when you have social information, it just is it's a two-way street, right? So you can put this vocalization, you can bring uh, what we're seeing um, in the case Brad was here ago, who turned, but then other predators can use that information, right? And so in this case, you know, actually black crown night heron eating a uh, eating a um, young, and then owls can sometimes be a uh, be a problem as well. So they find these. So in theory, a colony doesn't need to last forever. So most of these birds, if you look at their population dynamics, 
um, you know, they don't have to be successful every year. Every couple of years, producing young is what they need to do. And they probably need to move colonies occasionally because a predator, such as a great horned owl, can come in and kill a large number of them. So it's a dynamic system. And we need to understand how they select colonies in order to maybe help them. Next slide. So we talked about why a species are colonial, but how do they select a location of their colony? What cues would a uh, black crowned heron or other birds really use to select a breeding location? And what happens when they make poor decisions, right? So, um, you know, I have kids in, in college and I'm always telling them, make good choices, make, don't make poor decisions. But, you know, most of choices are good, but sometimes they're poor. And we have with, with uh, birds, they do the same thing. You know, they're going to nest in, uh, you know, an area that's going to be drained, an area that's going to be destroyed, an area that doesn't have a lot of resources, an area that's highly polluted with, with heavy metals. There's lots of times where they're making poor decisions. And, you know, I've worked with Brad, I work with the Army where we do constant contraction, and a lot of people give us a little bit of flack saying, well, how do we know better than the birds of where to go? But the reality is these birds evolved in a much different environment, right? Things are changing so fast, they don't know you know, what area is going to be destroyed by development, what area is highly polluted. And so we can help these, these birds make good choices. And this is particularly important with migratory species, right? Resident species don't have a lot of choices. They breed, they're born in an area, they might disperse a little bit, and then they're, they hang out there. Migratory birds have lots of choices to make throughout the year. And Sarah will talk, to you, talk about this um, in March. And then when they, so every year they come back, they have a choice to go somewhere else. Um, to establish a new area. And, you know, a lot of people think the reason why most birds that are declining in the U.S. and Canada are, migra are migratory birds is that there's so many factors that go into them. They have to make good choices during migration, wintering, breeding. And a lot of times they have a hard time because there's so, it's just such a dynamic world we live in these days. Next slide. So how to make good decisions. Um, we might need to help them decide where to breed. And, um, this might be extremely important in colonial birds. In non-colonial birds, we might help them as well, but if a few nests here, a few nests there don't make it, it's not a big deal. But if you have um, three colonies left in the state and they, two of them made bad choices and not reproducing at all, then you know conservation managers, other interested parties need to step in and try to help them out. Next slide. So that comes in to what we're doing. We're trying constant contraction with black crown night herons. These are some decoys painted by the talented undergrads and graduates at the University of Illinois. We use great blue heron models and painted them like black crown night herons. And then we play vocalizations of black crown night herons in habitats where we think would be conducive for breeding. We can protect them. And we think they're in areas where they're going to be anyway. So we, the, they actually can respond to this. I think you hit, hit the button again for next slide. I think there's, oh, go back one, sorry. So the, uh, this, um, yeah, go back to the, the previous one. So this site was in uh, Calumet. So it's in Calumet. There's a peninsula there where we, uh, Brad put up a fence to keep birds, keep predators from going out there. And we worked to um, uh, play vocalizations and have models out there. Sarah will talk about this a little bit more. Um, next slide. And the, uh, um, we had birds show up at the site. They didn't start breeding. But it might take a couple years, right? So um, there might be a certain number of birds that are non-breeders moving around the area. And so right now we're thinking about establishing multiple colonies. You know, some will fail. So our long-term plan is to try to get multiple colonies across Northeast Illinois and the whole Midwest. Uh, we have identified Brad's been working hard in Northeast Illinois. We have a couple other potential areas up in Lake County to try to establish colonies. It's an insurance policy against a large event. Right. So if avian influenza shows up in a colony, it could be bad news for uh, if you have one big colony. If a windstorm comes through and knocks on the nest, it's a bad thing. So we need to spread out the risk. We need to understand the factors that are impacting reproduction and survival. And this is what Henry and Liza are doing a great job at at uh, Lincoln Park Zoo. And then we might need to think about helping colonies respond to change. Right. So as all the trees are dying in a certain area. We might start thinking, well, we're not going to be able to save these trees. We're going to want to start putting up models and playbacks in different areas to kind of move these populations around. And so in the big long, in the big picture, long term, you know, black crown night herons might need, might need our help. They are not recovering like the other wetland birds. 
um, you know, it's kind of, I feel like this is almost full cycle, right? Audubon was helping hundreds of years, well, 100 years ago, and to try to save uh, water birds that helped. And now we have to actively go out there and try to help this bird. Um, and th in the case of the research I'm talking about, kind of specific attraction, trying to try to uh, entice them to other areas where they might be able to be successful in breeding. And hopefully we can find these tricks, these not tricks, the cues that these birds respond to to set up colonies and then set up colonies in a lot of natural areas throughout Illinois to try to really recover the species. And so I know for Sarah's going to talk more about this on March 27th about her research, which is um, very exciting. And uh, I think, you know, Night herons are doing not too great throughout the Midwest, but I think there is hope if we kind of work together and think about what we need to do to restore these populations. Next slide, Brad. I think that's it. Yep. So with that, again, thanks for everyone's attention. You know, it's a very exciting study. I hope you tune in on March 27th, and please, uh, Brian, will facilitate questions. First, thank you, Mike, Brad, and Mike. And uh, if you want to type some questions into the chat, um, if you have something specific to Mike, Brad, or Mike, you could uh, mention their name as you do. If it's a general question, we'll just kind of let them take turns. Heading back to the beginning, Pat Pearson asked about a link that the uh, Chicago Ornithological Society had posted about um, uh, help for herons documenting black crown night heron sites. I did follow the link. It seems to be up and working. But in you had a slide about uh, the um, Natural History Survey. Is there a link to a site where we can report our sightings? Maybe uh, one of you could drop that in the comments section so we can all find it later. But Brad? Yeah, I think that was the Biological Conservation Database. So yeah, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, has a, a place where you can report uh, sightings of endangered and threatened species. And I'll try to get a link to that to uh, to uh, put put there with with our talk. That's great, thank you, Brad. And uh, the, somebody else had asked about the prior recordings, and will this be recorded? Um, all of this will be is hosted by the Illinois Audubon Society, so IllinoisAudubon.org backslash Black Crown Night Heron Project. If you go to our website, that's where you can register for uh, Sarah's program. You can see Henry's program. And the recording for this will be posted probably early next week or uh, as soon as we get it edited and 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 up on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, scrolling down, there's a couple more questions here. Um, uh, somebody's wondering if lead levels are hurting these birds. Rita Jack asked. It's good to hear from Retta. The um, there was work in the survey years ago on lead levels in the Calumet, and I know Henry and people at the zoo are going to look at that as well. I mean, they're obviously a species that can bioaccumulate heavy metals, and the fact they're feeding on lots of fish in areas of Lake Michigan, they're highly um, have high levels of some of these nasty chemicals. It's something we need to keep an eye out, and that's why when we Think about constant depression and try to move a species somewhere. We can a priori go in there and look at lead constant. I mean, we don't know exactly where they're going to forage, but we have a rough idea. And so that's definitely a, a good question, something we need to keep our eye on. And I do want to just echo uh, Rita Renwick posted the, there was a, a, a message that went out from the Illinois Environmental Council and IAS this week that we need to pass a Wetland and Stream Protection Act for Illinois since the federal government has gutted their. Uh, wetland standards for the EPA. Um, so look for that and do send a note to your uh, representative. Um, Terry Wise from DuPage County asked um, about DuPage County having a night heron marsh forest preserve. Are there any sightings or activity there? Brad? I can answer that question. Uh, this is Bob Fisher, no. <laughs> Okay, Bob, are... thanks. You know, it's interesting how places get named. Like uh, I lived in a neighborhood where all the streets were named for oaks. And when they built the houses, the first thing they did is cut down all the oak trees. <laughs> um, so it used to be a forest. Uh, Rich Woods was the neighborhood in Peoria. And then uh, Matt Hayes asked, are migratory populations declining throughout the world or just in the United States? That's a good question. Um... They're declining in Europe and they're declining uh, in the um, United States, but also 
as I'm in Latin America right now and was talking to people today, um, there's concern down here as well. And in Colombia, some of their birds come up to us and they're declining. And so I'm not too sure about Africa and Asia, though I would, my hunch would be that migratory birds are declining in general across the world, mainly, you know, because they have so many different habitats that are so sensitive and, you know, we're developing, we're changing the environment. They're really at risk in a lot of different places. Um, thank you, Matt, for that question. And actually, I was kind of inspired getting ready for this evening. I went to my eBird uh, list, and I have seen black crowned night herons in several states and in Colombia, Mexico, um, and in Korea. But I have not seen one in Illinois, according to my eBird list. So I guess I just need to uh, get to the zoo this summer. <laughs> um, and then uh, Bob Stanley asked, with uh, the longer great blue heron necks, the decoys that we're using have a different body than the black crowned night heron. Were these decoys successful? And how widely does an individual heron generally forage? And, you know, we've had conversation behind the scenes. How might we adapt these uh, great blue heron um, decoys so they look more black crowned night heron ish? Right. Kind of I can speak question. to that. Um, so we've actually done a bunch of different. Um, types of decoys for some of the Metro East uh, rookeroos as well. Yeah. And uh, we actually have been able to, um, we've actually seen sightings of the birds in the area. The decoy isn't the only thing that's actually, okay. the only cue that they're using. Um, one cue that they're also focusing it on, we're actually playing um, audio cues. So uh, sounds that you would hear from uh, Black Crown Night here in Rookery. Um, sometimes they're breeding squawks, sometimes it's nestlings, that sort of thing. And we did have some success at Big Marsh with the uh, birds actually coming in to kind of check out what's going on. As far as we could tell, though, they didn't reproduce this for this past season. So maybe in the future. Yeah, and I'll add that the um, for birds, you never really know, right? So um, it's we, more research is needed to understand how the decoys are. Um, we just caught some vermilion flycatchers a couple of days ago by using red electric tape wrapped around a rock. <laughs> and so some birds are very sensitive to decoys, others aren't. And so we got to figure that out with the, the night herons. Well, that's why this uh, ongoing research project and the Black, Clown, the Black Crown Night Heron project work is so important. Thank you all for uh, listening in. Uh, going down the questions, Diane Schrift, um, or Diane Scherf, sorry, uh, asked, do they nest in Washington Park or just Lincoln Park? I haven't seen any confirmed nesting um, in Washington Park. I know there's a lot of foraging over there, but I don't think we've confirmed any nesting. I guess to add to that too, um, uh, black crown night herons can forage up to 15, 20 kilometers from their from their home roost location. So um, oftentimes you might see black crown night herons across the Chicago metro area, but many of them are going back, you know, to uh, to uh, Lincoln Park Zoo. You know, for the evening or for the day. And then uh, Natalia Moss uh, did post the link to uh, the DNR for registering your Black Crown Night Heron sightings. Thank you, Natalia. Um, and then Leslie Bournes asked, um, after the diseased ash trees along South Pond were cut, they were replaced with hybrid elms. Um, are these being monitored? Do you think there's any chance night herons might return to breed in that area? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That, that's what we're trying to figure out. What are the cues that where these birds select? Um, they they went from you know very unique habitat of, of nesting in Phragmites and cottonwoods to nesting in spruce and fir and pine and and uh, the, the ash trees. So um, we're trying to figure out whether it's a uh, a selection of a particular site and then they do the best job because there are some trees there um, above the red wolf and above the black bear that. They try to make nests the, in the trees, but the structure of the branches don't support the, the, the heron. So they don't seem to be selecting it based on the best tree for, for branch configuration and, and things like that. So this is this is part of the overall project is, is trying to figure out what cues these birds um, use in order to select uh, new new nesting sites. Um, Randy asked, could there be too limited of breeding sites for herons, egrets, and cormorants with those artificial structures uh, that you mentioned earlier? 
if artificial breeding sites were increased overall, there are more of them to a point where we're reducing competition with other wading birds, um, that the competition would decline and black crown herons could have the surplus. So what are you know we thinking in, in terms of increasing artificial sites? So that's a lot of what our research is starting to focus on, um, especially down the St. Louis Metro East where we've got multiple different uh, species. We've got snow egrets who are also threatened and endangered. We've also got um, uh, little blue herons, same type of thing where they would form like interspecific or uh, yeah, interspecific colonies. And we think that uh, habitat likely is one of the limiting factors. Um, again, as Mike was mentioning and as Brad was mentioning, we've got to try to cue in on what it is they're actually looking for in a breeding site um, so that we can make sure that if we were to create an artificial site, uh, that it would indeed uh, be successful. So one thing um, that I mentioned earlier, they do seem to cue in on these islands, whether they're um, artificial uh, and functional islands, or if they're um, just kind of a, you know, a different, different just separated habitat. Um, and toward that end too, um, you know, making sure that there's enough of these uh, different, uh, different artificial habitats such that, like you say in the question, that the black crown night herons would be able to uh, be able to really take over one of those sites, and they wouldn't be pushed out by other birds. Um, th that's that's great to know, and and I'm glad that we again, uh, Illinois Audubon Society is excited to be helping to support this research and the findings, and hopefully we can support this ongoing with your support, um, and then. Uh, uh, Oh, Nancy Tukowski did post the link to the wetland and stream legislation alert that came out earlier, if you want to follow up on that. Thank you, Nancy. And Katarina McLean has asked, um, no, she just makes a statement. I love your enthusiasm. She's seen them in Jackson Park in the summer and fall, and it's really cool to think they might be going back to the Lincoln Park Zoo at night and answering the question that you had answered earlier. Um, that they do forage, you know, uh, I think you said 15 miles or so. Um, and when they go out, I've I've seen from great blue heron rookeries that dispersal um, at dawn, whereas these are dispersing at dusk, which means twilight's a great time to be in or near the rookery. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Bob Stanley asked a question that I kind of just answered and you answered earlier. So Brighton Jelke, is it common for juveniles to stay in Chicago year round? I regularly see first year birds throughout the winter along North Branch near Lawrence and they seem separate from the Lincoln Park group. So is it common for juveniles to stay in Chicago year round is the heart of the question. I can, uh, the short answer is no. Um, so they are some stinking around, which is a very interesting question. So if you have the choice to stay in Chicago all winter or go to Florida for the winter, you know, I like Chicago, but why would you stay in Chicago? And so the, <laughs> You know, the question is cost, right? So if you got to migrate that far, it takes energy. You don't know where you're going. You might die. <laughs> so this is one thing that uh, Sarah's going to talk about in March, about the decisions they make and where they migrate to when they, when they don't migrate. And I mean, I personally think it'd be a hard, you know, they can make it through the winter there, but what's the benefit, right? The benefit might be the first one back to a colony. So maybe you get the best spot in a colony, but really we don't know. But the short answer is they do, but it's it's very rare. And that's all the questions we have. So thank you all for listening in. And if we want to go to that last slide, um, I do want to announce uh, more information is coming, but we are in the midst of putting together a really fun evening, Twilight in the Rookery, a behind the scenes adventure on May 9th at the Lincoln Park Zoo. When the zoo is closed, um, we're having this special event. It's uh, more than your average field trip. Uh, there will be some appetizers, but most exciting, you get to meet all of these scientists in person. You get to see the rookery near twilight when they're heading out to forage. Uh, there will be chicks. There will be um, young males who are still dancing and performing, uh, who haven't found a, a partner yet. Uh, it will be a great time to be in the zoo, behind the scenes tour. And so do keep an eye out for that. We'll open registration uh, just before the March event. Um, again, we are helping to fund this research and we hope that you'll join us in investing in conservation to keep these uh, 
earnest scientists, this wonderful team working. I will also go ahead and thank again the Lincoln Park Zoo, Lisa Eliza Lair and Henry Adams, the Bird Conservation Network with Bob Fisher, the Chicago Black Crown Night Heron Project with Amy Lardner, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana with Sarah Slayton. And of course, uh, let's give a big round of applause to Mike, Mike and Brad for this program. As already mentioned, uh, it'll take us a couple of days to get this edited and posted to YouTube, and then it will be at the IllinoisAudubon.org backslash Black Crown Night Heron website, as well as registration for the upcoming event in May. And uh, do tune in for Sarah's talk. Sarah's going to really focus on what we are learning in the research about where they go to forage. We're putting tracking devices on these birds. We're following them. Sarah's also helping to lead up that program about conspecific attraction and we're trying to get new colonies at, uh, at Big Marsh and other sites. So I'm really looking forward to that. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you for tuning in.